I, I can spend three days talking about uh, how to find them, how to finance them, how to close them. But as I was breaking it down and trying to figure out what I, what's always going through my mind, anytime I'm doing marketing, trying to find sellers, much like Andy, I focus almost primarily on seller direct contact. I, it's not that I don't like to buy off of the MOS or um, I just find I have better luck and better margins when I go directly to the seller. So if it's already on the MOS, chances are I'm not going to be your competition. I'm going to get it and probably be selling it on the MLS, which is one of the strategies I highly recommend. Get the deal, get it dolled up a little, and put it on the MLS. So when I talk about the basis of what I do, this says it all. As I, as I put on the back of that card, this is from a, a mentor of mine named Peter Fortunato. Some of you guys have been to take his classes. The guy's like, just the, has the, he's Neo. He's the matrix of real estate paper courses. The guy is, uh, He's just an energizer bunny too, he just keeps on going. Matt and I were talking about it. He went down and saw him in Florida. He said the first 50 minutes of that class, I could have left right there and had 20 or more things I could do in my business that would help me out. This is Pete's diagram, okay? This is the seven benefits of real estate. And, and really when you look at it, they don't seem obvious until you start talking about them. All the things that we're talking about, most of us, if, we're, uh, if you guys flip real estate, you're, you're in it for the profit. And profit's up there. I mean, I'll take profit when I can get it. It's not a bad thing. I mean, profit's not a dirty word. But if all you're looking at in that house is the profit and the price is not there for you, your buy price is not there, chances are, Jen, you're going to drive past that deal. If you don't look at the other six things that are in there for either you to use or for you to capture and pass on to someone else, James, then you might miss that deal. So a seller finance deal, let's be real clear. Seller financing is not a loan. It's not a loan. Seller's not giving you money. Banks give you money. My good friend Mike Cantu, a mentor of mine, said when you go into a bank, stay on the tile. Because if you go on the carpet, that's when you have to borrow money. So stay on the tile on the bank, right? That makes sense? And that's the deal is that sellers don't give you money, guys. They give you houses. I, I can't tell you the number of times sellers have said, well, I made you that loan. No, no you didn't make me the loan. You sold me the house. So that's a very important thing to understand is that when we say seller financing, that's a really broad term. It's like a big basket that I use to incorporate any time a seller is going to participate with you, Jonas, in the transfer of that real estate. Okay? So does it mean, uh, and have I had sellers give me money? You bet. I have sellers write me checks every month because their mortgage is too high, and I said, well, I'll pay some of it, but you've got to pay the rest of it. So in that case, it's not a loan, right, Andy? You're giving me money to help feed the alligator. When we talk about seller financing now, there's some or all of those benefits are going to go to somebody, right? Somebody gets them. You need to know which one can make you profitable or push your, push your ball down the road. You think about the business, I think about Indiana Jones, the movie. Remember that giant stone that was chasing him? He was running from it. I look at that every day, that's my business, and my goal is to just advance that ball just a little bit further than it was yesterday. Okay, I, I, that's my goal every day. I look at that as, a, as, a, as an achievement, if I can move the ball forward. When we talk about seller financing, what is it, and the question I always ask is, hey Riley, why would you want to sell a nice house like that? And you're gonna get a variety of answers. Probably the number one answer that I hear that 80% of the time is, I can't afford the pain. So they're looking for payment relief. When you look up there on that board, what, they're, what you're tapping into right there is their income. They're using part of their income to support a property that either they don't want, some of them don't even live in it, that's a lay down, right? If they don't live in it, what are you working so hard to keep it for? Other people are living in that house, guys, and they can't afford it. They lost a job. Um, dealt with uh, combat wounded veterans, you know, that's a shame too, that's one of those great pay it forward causes. Um, I've hired combat wounded veterans in my own business. I highly recommend you guys look to them as a source of uh, employees because they're fantastic. They know honor, they know courage, they know respect, and they show up on time. <laughs> they put a whole day of work here. You know, it's amazing how that works. Um, some of these things, I, I talked with a, a, a woman this morning, she's 
She lives up in Idaho. She owns properties in Southern California. She's owned it for 20 years. Why would you want to sell a nice house like this? She says, honestly, I don't think I want to because I'm going to have to pay so much tax because 20 years ago, I did a 1031 tax deferred exchange, and I know I'm going to have to recapture all this depreciation and pay the, pay the tax man. Right? So when I say, why do you want to sell a nice house like this? And she says, I don't think I want to. you got to start asking some probing questions. Tax benefits, that's one in there. If I can figure out a way, Andy, to help her push that tax benefit forward or minimize it, you know what? Jen, I'm probably going to get that deal. Because most of you probably heard that, you probably say, okay then, Jonas, I guess I can't help you buy. Would that probably what you probably say? Right? you, you got to look at this stuff. you got to know. So we'll go over, you know, growth. That's the one thing we can't really count on is appreciation. And that's when I say growth, that's pretty much what I mean is appreciation. That's the one thing that we always want. We all want appreciation, right, Todd? We go, yeah, man, I bought this house and 60 days later it was worth 20% more. Has anybody ever had that happen? Yes, that has happened. It can happen, but we can't count on it. Okay, but it's there. That's one of the things you can invest in. And when we buy a whole property, that's oftentimes one of the benefits, and I'm talking 10, 20, 30 years, guys, that you may see some growth. And profit, we talked about that one. Buy low, sell high, or buy high, right? So usually it's sell higher. That's profit. Income, we talk about income, we talk about rental properties. You know, Margaret, you buy a property, and you rent it, when you back out all your expenses, your debt service, there's some money left over for you, we hope. That's a good thing. Well, that's income for you, right? That's income that you work once for, and it keeps paying you. You know, I mentioned earlier, my life-changing event was a cardiac arrest. I woke up seven days later in a cardiac care unit. I didn't know what happened. I still don't remember what happened. I lost two days before, I don't remember. I have more brain damage than I was when I started, okay? But you know what was interesting? Is as soon as I gathered my wits about me and I looked over at my wife, I said, oh my gosh, what about all the bills? The rent checks came in. I didn't have to go buy more houses and make money because the rent checks kept coming. The tenants didn't know what happened. They just paid the rent. Why? Because I told them to pay the rent. I trained them to pay the rent. So income is really important. If you guys think when you're flipping houses, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. If you think when you flip houses that you're doing it for the check, you're really doing it for the income because you're going to do something with that money. Probably going to spend some of it, right, Riley? And if you spend it all at one shot, then what's the next thing? And you're going to go find another house to sell. Management. You know, one of the easiest uh, ways you can make money is manage other people's assets. If you can become a really good property manager, boy, Jim, you can, you can leverage your skill and your talent and your willingness to deal with the thrill of management. You can make some, some pretty decent returns. I mean, we're talking about what if somebody paid you $50 a month to collect checks for them, and you didn't have to buy the house, you didn't have to get a loan, and all you had to do was answer the phone once in a while and pick up some checks. How many $50 checks every month would you have to collect to have a pretty good stream of income? without any risk of your own, right, Matt? Matt deals with people every day that get loans. If you're not financeable, or if you've reached your peak on how many properties you can finance, or especially those of you that are new to the business, I highly encourage you to look into studying management. Because honestly, that's a great way to help manage other people's property. You can, you know, you can get, use a master lease document, which is to say that you become a tenant and then you can sublease to somebody else. Right, Bruce? And you can make the spread there if you so desire. Tax benefits. We talked about the lady I talked to in California who's, who has, she's going to have to pay taxes, a lot of them, she thinks, when she sells the property. Well, why, why does that happen? Because years ago, when she was buying and trading up, she was deferring her taxes so she would pay more later. And by the way, isn't that why the IRS lets you do that? So that you, hopefully you make a whole bunch more money later and they get a bigger payday. Well, how about that person, and all of us know at least one of them, high net worth person, Matt Atkinson, high net worth guy, making a ton of money. He has got write-offs, he's got his rentals. But what about that high net worth person, that doctor, that lawyer, that surgeon, 
that uh, CPA that really kills it and makes a lot of money, they desperately, trust me, you see the look on their face around April of every year, they're very down. What happened? Man, my taxes are killing me. You need to buy some real estate, my friend. Why? Because there's inherent tax benefits that come with owning investment real estate. You know, how many of you would like to have a property that cash flow is negative? Raise your hand really high. I wouldn't mind because why? I bet you I can find a fit for that. And if I'm making a lot of money doing my flips, what, what is a flip income? It's taxed at the highest rate, isn't it? Short-term capital gain. But if you're getting taxed and you get hit with that kind of big, good for you, make big checks, trust me. If you're, even if they took half of it, would that still be good, Jeff? You'd have half left. But that's taxes stink. I don't think you should pay more than your fair share. So figure out how the tax benefits work in real estate. If many times I bought a property from a seller and let them retain the tax benefits. Why? Heather, that's what they wanted. That's how I could best help them. Let them retain the tax benefits. I'm not a tax expert, okay? So don't, I don't even play one on TV. There are benefits to owning investment real estate. Amortization is the one that I think is most often understood, but it's really amazing. And constantly, I just get excited when I look at my balance sheet yearly. And here's another thing. If you're going to buy investment real estate, and some of you might disagree with me, um, besides watching your tenants day, don't look at your income and expenses, you know, every month and think, wow, this property's a winner or this property's a loser. Uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't always work out that way. What you'll have a tendency to do, guys, is dump a really good property because it had a bad month for you. you got to look long term. And, and, and the best way I can tell you this is I've had properties that I've owned for 10 years, Josh, and I now look at what I owe on it and I just smile. Because one of my good friends, Mick Blackwell, told me 15 years ago, Sean, one day you'll be worth what you owe. And it didn't sound like that. I was like, man, I owe a lot. And like, oh, great, when's that day going to happen? Yeah. And then all you got to do is wait 15 years. As he said, Sean, you'll be successful in real estate in 10 years. And I said, what? He said, that's a guarantee. I said, great. He said, you just don't know if it's the first 10, the middle 10, or the last 10. <laughs> and that has really proven true, honestly. And I'll, I've made the same guarantee to all of you. You will be successful in real estate in 10 years. I just can't determine if it's your first, your middle, or your last 10. When we make it in the first 10, we think we know everything, and we blow it in the second, the third 10. If we get it in the middle, we have a tendency to finish weak. The people who get it in the last 10 years, in my experience, and they've been the ones that have the longest staying power. So do me a favor, when you're looking at amortization, and clearly that is just this, if all, if you, all you did, Jim, was buy real estate from a seller, from Heather, and she said she wanted you to pay $200,000 for a property, and you knew, Andy, that that property wasn't worth a penny over 120 grand. But the kicker was, Heather says, I will carry the whole note. You don't have to qualify, you don't have to make a down payment, I just want $1,000 a month for 200 months. Now, are you overpaying for that property? Yes. According to the appraisal, you are. If the appraisal says 120, why would you pay 200,000? It's the terms, and that's amortization. And if you got your calculator out, that means that in 100 months, or half the term, you know exactly half the amount that Heather gave you. Now, I'm making it over simplistic, right? That's no interest. Okay, but what did she get? $80,000 more, Jane, than she could have got if she sold it for cash. Can you guys think of a situation where a seller might want an income stream rather than a chunk of cash? It happens all the time with retirees, with disabled people. As I mentioned earlier, combat wounded vets. How about heirs, Bruce, who get a property they never wanted, they don't want to touch, they never want to see it? And they're faced with the very real possibility that the only reason that they can't get what they want today, Margaret, is because this is the day they want to sell. Well, you know what they need? Todd, they need a time machine. And you guys can build that for them if you just factor in what your amortization will be. Man, I love direct principal reduction. Anytime I can make a $1,000 payment and all of it goes to my pay down, like I get goosebumps. Look right there. They're really there. Because <laughs> then you go back. Monica, you got a 10-year note, five years in, you're half paid off. I gotta tell you, 
That gets addictive, and you want to get more of that. Matt? So when you're writing below, you have a document called the truth and loving statement that shows you what your APR is. Correct. Based on how the rates are right now, you're still financing double the acquisition price. When interest rates are like five to five and a half to six, you're paying three times the amount. So right. $280,000 more, but a 0% over a 30 year period, you're actually probably saving. Yeah, the dirty little secret, thank you. What Matt said is when, when you've got a truth and lending statement, when you're borrowing money, even at today's rates, as low as they are, I mean, these are lower in all recorded human history. These are the lowest. That's just the reality. You're still paying, Emily, about double the price with interest over time. So what we have to get used to a lot of times is this amortization means in a typical 30-year loan with, with interest, right? the first seven years is heavily weighted toward paying interest. And it's the last 23 years where you start attacking more aggressively the principal amount, which is where we get into one day you'll be worth what you owe. Well, if you can put a tenant in that property, guys, that tenant can pay all or most of what that debt service was. I mean, your payment doesn't change with the exception of, you know, taxes may go up and whatnot, insurance. Your payment is level for 360 months. And if you can take rising rents and fixed rate interest payments, that's the way you win the real estate game. It really is. Amortization, because if, if that property doesn't go up $1, not $1, Bruce, at the end of 30 years, what will you owe on it? You will owe zero. And so you've gapped, you've created a gap between what you owe and what it's worth. And if you owe zero, and it's worth the same 200000 Jay. You've got options. Could you, could you encumber that property, Eric? Could you borrow money? Sure. Could you sell that property? Could you trade that property? Yes, you could. So amortization is super important, I think. Not really understood because what well, we get stuck on so many times, I think some of us get back in the uh, wholesaler mindset or the flip mindset. Oh, I got to get it, you know, 70 cents on the dollar. That's great if you can get that. But if you're Monica McQueen, she'd be willing to pay more than 70 cents on the dollar for a quality rental. Problem is, it doesn't matter how much money she has, it's finding the inventory that's probably driving her nuts. Anybody else have a problem finding inventory? Okay, well, when you shift, nobody, you know, only a few people, everybody else got all they need. It's fantastic. Matt, you got everything you need? I'm just lazy. You're just all right. <laughs> he flew in from Chicago and his arms are tired, right? Bottom right hand side, use goes along with management. Because use is who's going to live in it, gang? I mean, if you got one rental in one house you live in, unless you're, you know, wanting to call it a second home, uh, somebody's got to live in it, right? So you can you can leverage the use of that property. And that's what we talk, Jeff, we talk about tenants. Tenants want to live in it. They want to use it. What do I know about tenants, Susie? What I know about tenants is if you treat them right, and you screen them right, They'll stay with you until it's uncomfortable. And what do I mean by uncomfortable? Well, they die. That's uncomfortable for them. They can't pay when tenants die on me. Uh, their family grows, Margaret, or their family shrinks. So we have a family, a young family, and they're in a two-bedroom place. Jane, I pretty much know as soon as they have a kid, they're probably going to outgrow that place. But I plan for that, right? But what do I also know? When was the last time, as a landlord, you gave a rent decrease? Ah. Uh, now, raise your hand if you gave a rent increase recently. Oh, look at many more hands. You see, so if we can leverage, if we can leverage sellers who want to sell their property for any one of these reasons, and we can buy that property, even if we overpay, it's the same thing I say all the time, my good friend David Ken. It's your price, but my terms. If I can get the terms, and all you care about is price, I'm going to win. And guess what? You're going to win too. Why, Jen? Because you got your price. If that's what's important to you, call me. I'm your guy. I'll give you your price. And as far as tenants are concerned, that's where that management piece gets in there. If you want to do the management yourself, feel free. I encourage you guys to try it at least once. See if it's for you. Not everybody's cut out for property management. Anybody in here have that experience where it's like, yeah, it's really not for me? A couple people? It's okay. Here's the good news. 
There's people in here that probably really want to manage your stuff. Raise your hand if you love the chance to manage someone else's board. This hands went up pretty quick. So those guys that don't like it should get together with the people who like it. Trade that piece out. Does that make sense? No? Okay. Just assume it makes sense. Okay. So what I wanted to do is I, I wanted you to keep this, which is why I put it on the card for you. Because what I want you guys to do, and I'm going to take some questions here, I want you guys to know that anytime I'm talking to a seller, I'm trying to figure out, I really only need loud one. I really just need one of the seven. I gotta figure out, Todd, which one you don't want, or how many of those you don't want, and I can give you the ones you want to keep. That makes sense? Yeah? So hopefully you guys will be able to, I tried to make it big enough to see, but not so, you know, not so big that it was cumbersome. I want to take some questions from you about seller finance transactions. I know, I hope, some of you have questions. Andy. Andy said, the lady that had the tax problems, what would you tell her? Well, if you, if you study, and I am not a tax expert, but one of the things I said to her was, how much income are you getting now off the property? Okay. And by the way, are you married or single? Because I do know that if you're married or single, it dep that depends on exemptions that you can get. You know, single, $250,000, and married, $500,000. I also would ask her, Andy, is there any chance that you'd like to move into that property for the next couple of years? Why would I ask her that? Because if she lives in it two out of the five years, she can use an IRC 121 exemption. Internal Revenue Code 121 states that if you live in a property two of the last five years is your primary residence, what can you do? You can step up your basis, gang, and you can then exempt a certain portion of that property. Now again, I'm not a tax expert, so don't take my broad strokes as the truth. So I start asking questions, Andy, as to what kind of income you're getting now and how are you classifying the income? Because what I could do at that point is that for me becomes something if I can push that down the road using a lease or an option and capture some or all of these benefits, I can do that without uh, creating a taxable event for her. The key thing here, gang, is a, if a taxable event's going to wreck them, don't trigger the tax event. Find another way to capture some of those benefits. Yes, she could move back into it if she wanted to. Now, I asked her that. She's 70 years old, and she kind of laughed and said, yeah, I'm not really fit for travel at this point. However, listen, I'm talking to her in, uh, is in Idaho, and the property's in Huntington Beach. She said, I lived in Redlands at the time we saw that house in Huntington Beach, and the next day we bought that house, and we lived there for a number of years and then moved up to Idaho. I said, why would you leave Huntington Beach? Right up. But that's one of the reasons I ask those questions. Is that helpful? Another question? Yes. What about the admin issues, loan wise, when they say, hey, this guy has title of the home, he has insurance on the home, but the loan is the person saying, is there a flash there? So Cody's asking, what happens if you have the loan in one person's name and then another person owns the property, issues with insurance, homeowners insurance? You're the insurance guy. So here's what we do. The insurance on a property is, uh, you, you know, five casualty insurance, right? What is the bank, if a bank's on that property, what's the bank concerned with? Loss. You guys agree with me? The bank's concerned with loss. Who is insured? The bank is insured because their borrower is insured. Does that make sense to you? So what we do, anytime we have a property, and part of seller financing is, you're not always gonna find a property with no debt on the chain. Sometimes you're gonna have a loan on it already. And so that part of it is subject to, right? There's a debt on there, we're gonna take it subject to the debt. Well, that means a borrower was there before us, right, Cody? So if that borrower was there before us, and they have an insurance policy, we leave that insurance policy in place. The borrower in a subject to transaction is with you for life. So you pay that loan off, they're with you. So what we do, we have that bar will remain as the primary, and then we'll add ourselves or our entity as an additional insured. Do not make the mistake of transferring and flipping it. Don't make yourself the primary 
and your borrower's additional insured because that makes banks mad. Are we one high level agreement? Sure. So at that point, the insurance would be that primary that primary insurance from an insurance standpoint mm -hmm. would say, uh, we're not gonna pay for it because you have no insurance interest doing the additional insurance mm -hmm. for the primary insurer. The primary is on the policy. Correct. But you're the additional insurer I have a clear name. Right? Do they have a recognition of that? We what he's asking is if the primary insured is the borrower, right? And the title is held in somebody else's name, like my company, right? Do they have a problem with that? Well, hopefully, none of you have to go through a claim like I had to go through where we had a triplex burned down. Everybody was home at the time. Thankfully, everybody got out. But we had insurance and we were listed as an additional insured. Now, who is insured in the loss? The bank is insured. Now the property is insured, but who's going to make the biggest stink about it is Chase Bank. And what did Chase Bank want to make sure happened? They want to get paid off, right? And so the fire happened. By the way, keep making your payments as painful as it might be, Susie, even if you're not getting rents, because you need to make sure that you're keeping up with your obligation. If you read through a trustee, what's one of the reasons they can foreclose on you, Riley? Don't make your payment. <laughs> not that hard to do, right? So make your payments. And what happened is they came out, they, uh, the, and again, Matt just had this happen to him too, hire a public adjuster that works for you. First call, F-I-R-S-T, call. Uh, I don't have their number handy, but I'll email it to you. First call, we hired them, and they came in, and they advocated for us. And we got the first check, they basically wanted to write us a hundred thousand dollar check, Andy. The policy limit was three hundred and eighty. So a hundred's a lot different than three eighty. How'd they come up with a hundred? That's what was owed on the property. That's shocking. Right? Shocking that they would come up with that number. Okay? Uh, we didn't accept the hundred, so we got the full three eighty. But the first check they sent us was for a hundred. So we paid off that loan. First thing we did is paid them off. Is the bank happy? Yeah. The insurance company saw that there was the primary and that we were additional insured. What was important in that, Cody, is that we had good policy limits and that we had good inspection records. It's not, it's not just getting insurance, Riley. Right? Like, does your insurance company have the latest information? Because the things insurance companies don't like to do is pay claims. I get it. That's probably how they make money is not to pay claims. Get insurance, get enough insurance, and stay current with your premiums. And so, I don't know how everybody would handle it, but we've had that happen, and again, I hope you guys never do, but it worked out okay, and you know, we, we, we disclosed to everybody, primary and additional insurance. You don't have lost insurance for you. And we did get lost of rents. We had lost of rents coverage. It's insane. Great, you, it's, you definitely need to. Because it always happens when, you know, obviously I didn't plan, I was in California in November of last year, and I see on my, on my phone, I have KSL as one of my home screens. You guys have that the app. And I see fire in Ogden. I'm like, oh, suckers. Oh, that's mine. <laughs> I'm the sucker. Right there. That was horrible. Yes? If you met a seller financing person who would sell you their property in five years, uh -huh. and they wanted to sell it at market, mm -hmm. and you could, you could net zero, but you're writing the appreciation of the growth, hoping that in five years you can sell it for more, would you do it? So her question was, if I found a seller that wanted full market with a five-year term, and you were going to net zero, so you were, you were banking on appreciation to do it, uh, say again. Well, that, that's, a, that's a hard box to put me in, but the short answer is, yeah, I would, I would put something together. If I have a seller that's willing to work with me, and price is an early concern. What I've done in the past is I've said, listen, we're going to put five years in here, Bruce, but I want an automatic five year extension in the event I can't do what I said I would do because I don't have uh, the ability to tell the future and I haven't really had a problem with it. I have had, as probably some of you have had, a seller that's very obstinate that says, well, I want all cash today, open market. Yeah, I said, go, go and find people that'll do that because I can't. And then when you don't find them, call me back. And it's funny, they always end up calling me back, somehow. So I would just put an automatic extension in there that would make sure that they know that you're saying, I, I will try to do this, but in the event I can't, I want to disclose. I said I'd try, but if I can't, 
you get the property back. When you do solid finance transaction, it has the securities and the collateral, right? Securities and the property you're buying. Heck, if they're not willing to put their collateral, the security against the collateral will sell you, you better be suspect. Why don't you, if you don't like your own house, why am I buying your house? Is that helpful? We got someone over here. Eric. Do you, uh, on your option with 20 payments for $1,000, and say you set it up that way, right. can that work if they have a mortgage payment? What Eric's saying is, can that, if I said 200 payments at $1,000 a piece, can that work if they have a mortgage payment? Well, if the mortgage is, the same or below, sure it can. What if you pay their, your, their house off to them in two years, but they still owe the bank for 30 years? So what Eric's talking about is what if you, here's here's an interesting thing, because you can get caught on this sometimes. A number of years back, I had a realtor who brought me seven properties from one seller, and he was very excited. He was really excited. He said, hey, Sean, this guy will sell you all these properties for this much. And I said, okay, that actually sounds good. I said, by the way, what would the payment be? He said, well, what do you want the payment to be? You know, I was like, oh my gosh, everybody said this would happen one day. I, I, didn't, believe, I didn't believe it. I was trying not to get a little sweaty. I was excited. I felt like I had too much coffee. And I was like, uh, well, let me get back to you on that. Isn't that why I always say when we don't know the answer, I'll get back to you. Let me crunch the numbers. So I went and looked at all the properties, and it was getting better and better. And I was like, man, this looks pretty good. I don't know. I don't know this guy can. Then I called my title officer. Boy, if you guys don't have a good title escrow, man, you need to do it. The funny thing was, he was trying to sell me those properties just for about $300,000 less than he actually owed to the banks, okay? And the payment he was willing to give me, which was so sweet, I mean, we're talking seven houses. Guess what my payment, he said I, my payment could be? Yeah, 1,500 bucks, <laughs> nailed it. I was like, shout, why wouldn't I do that? Except his debt service was 3200 bucks. <laughs> so, yeah, that deal's not going to fund, right? Uh, it, and by the way, it was shocking that he wanted me to make payments directly to him. <laughs> Which, heck, for that amount of money, right? And I was like, heck yeah, man, no down payment, 1500 bucks a month, sure. So, you can't, something's got to give. It's like, always important for you guys to verify what's owed on the property and make sure that your numbers match, right? I mean, I'll do tandem amortization, like make it even, but you, you can't go under unless there's a provision in there that one, somebody's got to pay the freight. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. On Eric's and uh, Joey's example, do you always want to get a copy of the mortgage note and the underlying mortgage? Yeah. Write this down, get a copy of the mortgage note. Yeah. So then you can determine what the amortization is yourself. Right. So if the interest rate was over a 30 or a 5%, they only had a $40,000 note, you're buying for $100,000. Yeah, of course, it paid off quicker. And then on Joy's example, you could write in the addendum that as long as you uh, make the payments on time for 48 months, it'll automatically clip over or extend another five year term based on you performing. And most sellers are okay with that because if you did it for 40 years with another five. When you guys heard Andy speak, he talked about nibbles. Take a little nibble, right? You did, right? That was awesome. Six months ago, yeah. What's the last time I heard you speak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. not tonight. But when he heard you speak before, he talks about nibbles. And that's a great way. That's that's a nibble. If I do this, if then, right? It's called an if then statement or an if then close. Well, if I do this for 48 months, then would you lower my rate or extend my payment? If Can I get credit for my on time payments? Those are only things, guys, that you can do with a seller, as a seller financing. If you call Chase Bank and you go, hey, if I make my payment on time for 48 minutes, uh, no, the wrong number, don't call me again. Okay. Get a question right here. So the matter of tax benefits, if you have a seller that's willing to, they want to finance it, but want to maintain the tax benefits, how do you structure that? So what he's asking is, if I have a seller that wants to sell it and wants to maintain the tax benefits, what could I do? If I want all the other benefits, that's a great play for an option. Because if I can give you an option for a future purchase, what do you get to keep having the whole time? You keep everything until I actually exercise my option. But my, what do I ask for? I want the right to use it and rent it. I want that management. In this case, he's gonna keep the tax benefits and I might ask him, you know what? Any payments that I've made, I want credit for them when I actually exercise. So what am I actually getting? I'm actually getting that amortization, right? So that's one way you can use an option. Let them keep the ownership, because in an option, 
Ownership does not transfer until you exercise that option, and they're not taxable until you exercise them. That makes sense. Say again. Uh, yeah, you can use a contract for deed, land contract, installment sale agreement, something like that. And in that regard, now, then again, you've got to make sure you're, again, I'm not a tax expert, but here's a funny thing about the IRS. Any of you in this room can claim anything you want. That's the truth. You can claim whatever you want. It's just if they audit you, they'll disallow your deductions. So if somebody says, well, I guess it takes tax benefit. Hey, everybody, everybody jump in and take tax benefit. What's going to come down to is who paid for it. Does that make sense? Who's making the payments? So I like letting the sellers take the tax benefit because what do they have to do? Gosh, got to make the payments. Heck yeah, they give me the, you give me everything else and you make the payment because you want the tax benefit. Well, I'm going to take the income though. How's that? One of the hardest problems for people when they sell their house is what? They lose a tax deduction. Right? That answer your question? Again, I wish I had three days to teach you guys this stuff. Just don't right now. Right. So I'm working on a deal and the customer, the seller, right now, yep. they have been working, they have been working on the solution for it. He probably wants to put $50,000 more than he has to work. Right. The problem is he needs about $30,000 for repairs to the house that I can have for this point. What's the solution? Craig says he has a seller that wants income. You said he wants $50,000 more than the house is worth. And it needs 30,000 in repairs. Okay. A couple of questions you have to ask yourself as a qualifying statement. Why did A, what are you gonna do with it? Are you gonna keep it as a rental? And if so, does it cash flow? What I mean by that is, is there debt on it now? So he owns it free and clear. That's good. We can start fresh, clean slate. I like free and clear houses, it gives me more flexibility. What is the property worth? It's condition. Yeah. More than thirty thousand uh, dollars? Okay, so it's worth at least more than thirty, though, because you said you need thirty in repairs. One of the what things I've done in the past is you have that person either go get a equity, home equity line of credit or a loan on themselves. Have, do they pay tax, Matt, when they borrow money against their own asset? No. So they could get a tax-free loan from a bank using the collateral as the asset. No matter if it's a disrepair, they're not going to appraise it for the full amount, right? So if you got a $70,000 asset and you need 30 out of it, you can go have them create their own pipeline funding. If they're unable or unwilling to do that, then you have them deed it to you, give them a, a, a security instrument. What is that? It's a first trustee. Isn't that what we call it? First trustee? And then what can you do? He wants, uh, what did you say? $50,000 more, so he wants like a buck 20? Oh wow, two hundred. Okay, so again, we're looking about two hundred thousand dollars first trustee, right? Two in a year, and then tell him as soon as I give you this trustee, I intend to buy it back from you at a discount for cash, right? Just discounting notes. How much does he want to get out of it? How much was that he wanted to get out of it? Whatever that number is, first thing you do, get the property. Why? Because with the collateral, what can you do? You can go get money. You can borrow against it. Give him a note, deed of trust. Then go borrow from a hard money source, a local bank, okay? And you have that guy do one of two things. Discount that note to you, or one of my favorite things to do is find another property and take that note and put it somewhere else. What would that then do? Leave you with the free and clear house, Andy, that you can go borrow money from, fix it, and then what? Do whatever you want with it, right? That makes sense to you? So what we're really talking about is use what you have, to get what you need, to get what you want. You got the house, you need some money, right? So you can have what? The house. If you got a house that's free and clear and it needs repair, can't you go borrow the money off the house and fix it, Jay? Could you do that? Will it be worth more after it's fixed up? God, to fix up? Probably. Sometimes the owners themselves are financeable, they just don't know it. Why don't they want to borrow money, Matt? They don't want the payment. Because if you go borrow the money, keep all of it, and give me the house with the new payment. Did I just create a tax-free transaction for them? That one I did. At least the money that came out, they borrowed it themselves. Hey, why don't you borrow the money, David, and then give me an option to buy the property? Have I created a taxable event? Uh-huh. They borrowed the money, Andy. That wasn't a taxable event. Curtis was an option a taxable event. 
not until I exercise it. There's a little bit to learn, I guess, about seller financing. <laughs> right? Just a little bit. Anybody else? I want to try to stay true to our timeline. We're about five minutes over where we should be. Are there any other burning questions? Yes. I just have a question about that. Uh, he wants 200 and you're saying give him a bill of sale, I mean like purchase agreement, uh -huh. 200. He's not going to get his 200 if you're going to come back and discount it up, right? What we're saying is if he wants $200,000 and he wants a chunk of money up front, which is what I think I gathered from Craig, you can give him security because why would he give you the house without having some security, right? So if he, if he gives me the house and I give him a marker, basically worth 200 grand, everybody see that? Now Dave, I need to go borrow money because I say, look, you don't have the 30 grand to fix it. So I'm gonna borrow $30,000. What will you have to do if you're a trustee? You'll have to support me, right? You'll have to go into second position. Is your $200,000 still secured by the same asset that we talked about? Sure it is. But now I was able to secure the funding to fix the property. Is that true? Yes? Why not have the property pretty good? Uh-huh. And his motivation is uh, income. Yep. So he's looking for a monthly income. And the property is asking for 200000 which is all market. Right. What's the property currently in principle? Well, because of its current condition, because of the repairs, mm -hmm. most people just wouldn't make more than 70000 What would a bank loan on it? What would a bank loan on it? What would a hard money loan on it? Yeah, there you go. Can you get a hundred out? Probably not. Can you get eighty out? So here, here the philosophy would be: go bring as much of that as you possibly can above and beyond his fifth, right? He wants the cash, uh, and then structure the income to him according to his needs and vary the interest so he can pay down quickly. Take the balance of that, put it into repair using his borrowing power, so you don't have to support him. Don't put a second on it. You bring his cash out of it. You also bring the rehab out of it. Then you know, they've got it potentially. Uh, Bruce is teaching next month. Yeah. <laughs> Remember this philosophy. Use what you have to get what you need to get what you want. Anytime you can use that property to generate what you need, which is money, fix up capital, to get what you want, which is a house anyway, that's the best thing to do. So whether whether it's my strategy or Bruce's solution or Matt's or Andy's. See what happens when you get a room full of smart people together, everyone starts clicking. But you know this only happens when you have somebody sitting across from you that wants to do business with you. What is it when someone is, I've never bought a house from anyone that didn't want to sell it, Tim. Why? They want something else more than they want the property. They want income, they want a chunk of money, they want to move to North Carolina and be with their grandkids. They don't want what they have. They used to want it, don't want it anymore. Your job is to figure out, Jim, what they want instead of the house. Is it a stream of income? Is it a chunk of money? Is it what? That's your job. And you only get to ask those questions if you sit in front of them and you ask them, Heather, what do you want? Why would you want to sell a nice house like that? If you can keep this diagram in mind, I'm hoping that you'll have more success. Read the bottom. The foundation of each transaction is security. If a party does not believe that she or he will receive the promised benefits, there will be no deal. I can sit, sit here and tell you what you're going to get. If you don't believe me, it won't, you won't do the deal. So we can promise the world, but if we don't have an actual plan to deliver it, they won't believe us and they won't do the deal. Does that make sense? I carry this around, know it, remember it. If you flip that card over, you can see that I, I do teach free classes the third Wednesday of every month. All I ask is you raise your hand, Emily. You call this lady in the front row, numbers on that card. Just tell her you'd like to come to the class. I have a 1 p.m. class and I have a 6.30 p.m. class. We'll talk about whatever you want for three hours. Is that fair? If you don't like it, I'll give you a full refund. <laughs> best I, it's the best I can do. Okay? I want to make sure to encourage you to come to the Slurry meeting next month. I want to encourage you to bring your friends, bring your the people you work with. If you, if you're, if you, by the way, how many people do we have here for the first time? We hope that you'll come back, that you'll be part of our community for 99 bucks for the whole year. Gosh, it's not that big of an investment in your education, Matt. Andy, how much have you spent on education in your investing career? More than 99 bucks. Time, cash, 
drilling in dry holes, meeting with people that don't really do what you want to do, they don't sync with you. Over improving properties. Over improving properties. You've got some great educational opportunities. Uh, I'm going to Jeff Red, Red Leo, right? I don't want to say it the wrong way. Jeff's teaching a class on structuring and uh, LLCs and, and uh, entities. I'm there. I'm going with my buddy Matt Hunsaker. Um, uh, Matt's teaching a class on June 1st, Rehab Bus Tour. You guys want to learn how to rehab from a pro who does it all the time? And avail yourself of that. Are you giving a discount at all? There's three members. I don't know. I know it's your own deal. Free ice cream at the end. Free ice cream at the end. <laughs> no, that just happened. Boom. That just happened right there. Did you see that? See, pay the full right Give that man a wristband. Give him two wristbands. So go to the website, look at the educational opportunities that we have for you. Become a member if you're not a member, and please go bring other people with you and, and let them meet the people that are here. Hopefully we can do some good deals together. Alright, so we'll see you next month. This is the time when you network. Please remember to return your uh, name tags to the front. You have a closing comment? What's that now? The two halves? Oh, so Craig wants to ask some things to the group. All right, go ahead. Hey, Dan, how are you? My name is uh, Craig Barry. I've actually been coming to these meetings for the last year and a half. Uh, one, I've worked with a couple mentors uh, that are nationwide mentors, and they're just hitting it out of the park, and their secret is they've actually created mastermind groups. You've heard of that. If anybody's interested or doesn't know what a mastermind group is, if you can meet with me briefly after that, I'll tell you a little bit in terms of what I'm doing. Also, I have a property under contract in Boise. It's a great deal for me. It's a great deal particularly for either you or someone you know in Boise. If you have an interest or contacts in Boise, talk to me after the meeting and I'll give you the, uh, the uh, details. But the Mastermind is a great program. It's basically an extension of what Sean was talking about tonight. You're working with like-minded people who can vet ideas. And instead of trying to do the business for yourself, which is like slamming your head against a brick wall, Work with a group, with a smart group, or some other group, which can be a lot more successful and be a lot more profitable, a lot more quicker. So come in, introduce yourself, talk to me at the meeting, and Great. You have two lunches, by the way, too, every month.